And so part of Friday, I'll set aside for a review. Probably what I'll do is go through one of those problems I mentioned to you from an old exam, where we combine hedging with futures and hedging with options. Um, so you might look at last year's final prior to Friday, uh, which will help follow the uh, review. So we left off with a discussion of the Black-Scholes uh, Greek letters, and I just have a few things to say on that, and then we'll move into hedging with options. And there are really only two possibilities, and I'll go through one of them with you, and then another one on Friday. So we talked a lot about the delta value, and uh, we said that the delta uh, can be interpreted as a probability that uh, an option is uh, going to stay in the money or stay out of the money. Uh, if the, the delta is close to one, then that option must be deep in the money, so there's a high probability that it will stay in the money. If the delta is very low, it must be deep out of the money, and so the probability that it will move in is low. And if it's at the money, then it's 0.5. This is a, just another way to graph it, and there are, uh, there's a positive and a negative sign on the delta. This shows for a $7 strike price, suppose this is the soybean market. Uh, so we have a call option, and it's a $7 strike price. So the delta will be uh, 0.5 for a long call if you buy the call. The seller of a call will have a negative delta because uh, a long call, in a way, is like holding a long futures position. If the price rises, if the futures price rises, if you go from 7 to 8, then the holder of the call uh, will make a profit. So we put a positive sign on the, the delta for the holder of the call, whereas the seller of the call will incur a loss if the price rises. If you're selling a call, you don't want the price to rise because then it will move in the money, and you'll incur a loss. So we put a minus sign on the delta for uh, the individual who sold the call. So the delta ranges between 0 and 1, but it can be positive or negative depending on the impact of the, on the profitability. Uh, similarly for a put, so that was for a call, if we have a put, uh, the same idea, the delta ranges between 0 and 1. If you purchase a put, so it's a long put, um, then the delta has a negative sign, and if it's a short put, it has a positive sign. So holding a put is sort of like uh, holding a short futures position, where if the futures price falls, that's when you make uh, a profit. So uh, for the futures price, if the futures price falls, the holder of a put will make a profit, so the sign is negative. So for you to uh, experience a profit, the price must fall, so they're going different directions. That's why we call the, put, a, put a negative sign on the delta. But it still ranges between 0 and 1. Okay? So um, that's just a, a slight twist on that particular component of the Black-Scholes formula. You know that the delta measures the relationship between the change in the futures price and the change in the premium. You can interpret it as a probability and we'll sign it positive or negative depending on whether you've sold or purchased the call or the put. Okay? Um, let me touch on a few other points, and these are covered in Chapter 8 with regard to these Greek letters. And you have an understanding now of um, what, what they mean and their importance. And here we talk about the volatility effect, the lambda. And uh, so I've done the same thing. I have a $7 strike price on soybeans. And you know that you can compute the lambda from the website that we looked at last week, www.freeoptionpricing.com. That's a real mouthful. Uh, that's where you can go, and you can compute the lambda. And you'll see that the lambda will vary depending on, don't trip over my cords. <laughs> she got caught in the maze. The lambda will vary depending on days to expiry 
and also depending on whether the option is at the money or deep out of the money or deep in the money. So let's just think about this for a second. Now let's just choose this one, the 60 days to expiry, and we see the lambda is the highest for the option that's at the money. So the, again, the lambda measures uh, the impact of a change in volatility on the premium. So the option that's at the money is more sensitive to volatility, which makes intuitive sense if we go back and think of um, the interpretation of uh, the option that's deep out of the money versus one that's at the money or, or deep in the money. It makes sense that it's more sensitive to an option that's at the money because as the volatility changes, if you're at the money, you can either move in or out, correct? And that's what's critical to a trader. So if the volatility goes up, if you're at the money, uh, then it just increases the likelihood that you could move in or out of the money. So it makes sense that it's more, po more sensitive. If you're deep out of the money, so if you're way out of the money, if, let's suppose it's a crude oil call option and um, the strike price is, uh, you know, $50 a barrel, um, gives you the uh, right to go long at $50 a barrel and the futures price is now 40, it's deep out of the money. So even if the implied volatility goes up, and we saw that it did go up in the case of crude oil, even if the, the volatility rises, that option that's uh, deep out of the money uh, will not be overly sensitive to the increase in volatility. It will respond, but it won't be as sensitive as one that's, that's at the money. Okay? Um, and it also makes sense that it, an option that uh, is further from expiry will be more sensitive to the volatility because there's simply greater uncertainty the further you are from expiry. If the volatility goes up, the um, impression is that it could remain high until expiry, so you'll, you'll find that they're more sensitive. So this is just to illustrate the fact, somebody asked me the question um, on Monday as to whether or not these Greek um, components of the black shoals are stable or not. And we were talking about the delta, and it's, it, it's not stable, it changes. And all of these variables will change. As you can see, if you go to that website and, and type in some different prices, you'll get back different lambdas and different thetas and different deltas and so on. So here's the theta, again, which measures the sensitivity of the premium to time. So options are an eroding asset, um, and certain options are more sensitive to time, to time than others, and those options that are more sensitive to time are those that are at the money. So if you're looking at uh, the erosion of time value, you'll find that options that are at the money, the time value will erode more quickly than options that are either deep out or deep in the money. Very same reasons that we talked about why the volatility is more sensitive when you're at the money. Again, it goes back to the probabilities. You're at the border, it could easily swing in or swing out, and so things like time and volatility just have a bigger impact on the premium. Okay? So the Greeks uh, do change, and here's another one, the gamma, which measures how the delta changes. Right? We said the delta isn't constant, so if you take the, the second derivative, uh, we see how the delta changes with the futures price. And it's also the case that the options that are at the money are going to have deltas that are more sensitive. Now we talked um, briefly about the importance of the delta to the hedger, and we'll get into that in a minute, uh, because when you're hedging, uh, one over the delta will give you the number of positions that will give you a hedge ratio of one, you know, if the delta is 0.5, you need two contracts. And so if you're trying to decide which option to hedge with, that's a decision you have to make when you're hedging. Of course, when we were hedging with futures, it was much more straightforward. If 
uh, we had a, an open cash position that was to be liquidated in February, then typically we'd choose like a March futures or something that expired after our cash position was to be completed, right? So that was pretty straightforward. Choosing the month was not a big deal. When you get into hedging with options, you know that you have that range of strike prices. So not only do you have the month, but you have to choose the strike. You know, Southwest Airlines, when they hedge their jet fuel requirements, for the most part use the options market. And so it's not just a matter of choosing the month, but what strike price do we pick? And so you can see here why this uh, information is relevant, because if you pick a strike that gives you an option that's at the money, well then that delta is going to be jumping around to a greater extent than if you chose an option that was either deep in the money or deep out of the money. Okay? So this will affect the uh, hedger's choice and uh, it, you know, there's a, everything in life is a trade-off including uh, which option you choose in the futures market. Um, you choose one that's uh, in the money, it's going to be more expensive, but at the same time, the delta will be more stable. Okay. So um, that's pretty much it on the Black-Scholes formula. Uh, in terms of what I expect you to know in the final, it's more or less what I've covered in class. Okay. The the information I've covered in class. Um, so let's move on to hedging with options. And you know, we're almost there. You have to be patient. I can tell that you're looking a little exhausted, but it's it is the last week, I know. But we're very close to wrapping this up, and it, it does come together very neatly. I think if if you uh, are successful on the final with that last question, you'll feel very good about yourself over the holidays because it's a it's not an easy question, but it brings all the material together into one question. Okay. And let's work towards that. So let's talk about hedging with options. You know about hedging. I don't have to tell you um, too much more about hedging, except that there's a, another vehicle that's available, the options market. Some hedgers like the options market, like Southwest Airlines, because in a way, it's more like buying insurance, you know, we talked about the old you can't have your cake and eat it too when you're buying or selling futures contracts to offset risk in the cash market. Uh, when you're hedging with options, well, to some extent, you can have your cake and eat it too. Because if there's a significant price move um, in a favorable direction, well, you simply throw the option into the fireplace, right? So uh, Southwest Airlines is hedging against a rise in fuel prices. You know that fuel prices have been falling the last while. Suppose they continue to fall. Well, the benefit of hedging with options is um, you throw the option away because it will be worthless, and then you can purchase the fuel at the lower price. Unlike if you had uh, a futures position, the profit or loss in the futures will more or less offset the profit or loss in the cash side. That's not the case with options, as you know, because the most you can lose is your premium. So uh, it gives commercial firms a lot more versatility, flexibility, if you like. Uh, but there's no free lunch, okay? There's no free lunch. Because with options, you pay the premium, and you know with futures, you don't. Um, so it's true it comes closer to providing traditional insurance uh, in that you can either establish a floor price or a ceiling price. So if you're Southwest Airlines, you're interested in the ceiling price, right? You want to pay a certain maximum for the fuel. You don't want to have to pay through the roof, right? So you want to pay a certain maximum for the fuel. And that's a ceiling price, so you'll use options to establish the ceiling price if you're short cash. If you're long cash, then you're worried about a price fall. So that's a hedger who's, who owns the, the asset or the commodities, worried about a price fall. 
And then you don't want to have to sell at a price that's gone through the floor, right? So you want to establish a floor price. So that's what hedging with options does, is it gives you either a floor price or a ceiling price. In a way, when you're hedging with options, you take a cash position and an options position, and you create another synthetic options position. So you can think of the floor price as being the flat spot on that synthetic position, or the ceiling price as being the flat spot on that synthetic position. And I'll show you a graph as to what I mean. So uh, that's what you're trying to do, unlike with futures, where you're trying to lock in that current cash price, right? With futures, when we had our matrix up there, when we were hedging, and we had today's cash price, that was your objective. And when I asked you to calculate the outcome of the hedge, it was always relative to the cash price today. You know, did you get a lower or higher price? Uh, that's not the case with options. The objective is a floor or a ceiling price. Um, so you can, I think you can see that it gives you a lot more flexibility, but it, as I say, there's no free lunch. It doesn't mean that options are superior to futures. Southwest happens to like options. It works for them, but not all hedgers do. There's still a lot of hedgers that use the futures market instead. So let's look at um, some of the pros and cons of using options versus futures. Um, so you know the story on futures, pretty much. Um, you're subject to margin calls. Um, that's bad. Uh, and you know the story on metal shaft, and there are plenty of examples of hedgers who um, had a legitimate hedged position, but were experiencing such massive margin calls that either the bank pulled the plug or they pulled the plug and got out of the hedge halfway through, and then the market turned around and went the other direction again. And you know, it's, it's, just, it's a sad story, but it happens a lot because of margin calls. They're not insignificant. Um, so that's the downside of futures, margin calls. The plus is that there's no premium, right? Using futures contracts has sort of minimum cost. The, the cost of executing a trade is so small, it's insignificant. And now with electronic trading, I told you that Eurex is coming to town. They're going to set up an electronic exchange in Chicago, which is pretty interesting. Uh, Chicago Board of Trade and the Merck are not very happy about it, but Eurex is going to come to town, set up an electronic exchange, and try and attract all the large traders over to trade the same contracts the Board of Trade offers, but at a lower fee. So those fees are even coming down. With futures, I'm just going down that left-hand column. As I said, you're trying to lock in the cash price. Of course, it's always subject to the basis risk, and you know how that works. The basis change can add or detract from the hedge. And so the number of strategies is, is somewhat limited. Um, and then you have options, okay? And the number of strategies is, uh, is very high. Uh, just so you can relax, uh, I'm not going to ask you a question on the final about selling options as a hedge, okay? It'll either be buying a call or buying a put. You will not be in the, in the big question, which I call the big question. Um, you'll not be asked to sell. So you don't have to worry too much about this column. Uh, but you know, I just want you to realize that there are a lot of sophisticated strategies with hedging in the options market, and some of them do involve uh, selling. So let's look at, at buying options. Um, so there's no margin calls, which is fantastic, right? If Metal Shaft had been using options instead of futures, uh, it's quite possible they wouldn't have ended up in the mess they were in because there are no margin calls. So the board of directors and the bank wouldn't have been on their back because of these large margin calls. That's what pushed them over the edge. With options, you pay the premium, and that's it. Right? You buy a put, you buy a call, you pay the premium, and you're done. Um, that's a plus. A negative is the fact that you pay the premium. Right? It's it's. Uh, there's no free lunch with hedge, you know, with futures, you sell or, or buy a contract and you pay a small fee to the broker. Uh, with options, you're, you're buying the right to go long and short, and you have to pay the writer this fee. It's called the premium, and the premium can be pretty high, as you know, uh, because we've been calculating uh, those premiums and breaking it down into the intrinsic value and the time value, so it's not insignificant. So that's really the cost of the insurance. 
uh, as I said a few minutes ago, instead of trying to lock in a price, you're really trying to establish a floor or a ceiling, depending on whether you have a long or a short position. Again, if you're short cash, you have to buy the asset at some future date, and so you're trying to set a, a maximum price. So that's why you want a ceiling. If you're long cash, then you're going to be selling the asset at some future date, and that's why you want to set a floor price. And you can choose where to set the floor by choosing the appropriate strike price. You can choose where to set the ceiling by choosing the appropriate <coughs> strike price. But again, there's no free lunch. If you want a low ceiling, okay, you're southwest and you want a low ceiling, uh, then you're going to have to pay a higher premium. Uh, and we know that that's costly. So you can choose where the, s the floor or ceiling is subject to basis risk, okay? Subject to basis risk. Um, there's a lot of strategies, okay? I'll just mention selling options. Um, again, you can establish floor or ceiling prices and you combine these with uh, underlying cash positions. Um, but it's, it's, it's really beyond this course to get into those, okay? So do you have any questions as to what I'm talking about here? Does it make sense that you can set a ceiling or a floor price instead of trying to lock in a cash? Does it make sense that options versus futures uh, is not clear cut in terms of which strategy is the most uh, beneficial? I mean, the, the issue with options is you have to pay that premium. And as you know, the price has to move a certain amount before you even get the premium back. So that's, that's where the rub comes in. That's why sometimes you're better off using futures contracts rather than options. But as I said, with options, you can have your cake and eat it too. So if the cake shows up, I mean, you want to have options, right? You don't want to have futures. Um, so the cake shows up, and that's in the case of Southwest where the price of oil goes through the floor. I mean, the price of crude drops down to $20 a barrel. And they had protection against the rising price, and they toss that in the fireplace, and then they can buy their fuel at the low price today. And if they had futures contracts, you know that that's not the case, because with the futures hedge, you're locking in today's price. So if today's price is $40 a barrel, and the price goes to 20, well, you still pay 40, but you're insuring against a rise to 50, right? That's the story with futures. With options, if the price today is 40, and the price goes to 20, well, you pay 20, right? Plus whatever premium it costs you. So you pay 20 plus something, which is a heck of a lot better than paying 40. That's why options can be superior to futures. However, if the price rises, okay, and that's what you're trying to protect against, then you're probably better off with the futures than the options because there's no premium with the futures, right? And you're trying to insure against that rising price. And so you hold your futures contract, you'll profit there in the rising market that will offset the higher price you pay in the cash market, and there's no premium to worry about. Did you follow me? Okay, we'll, we'll do this with numbers too. This is just words so far. Okay, so I've already explained this in words, um, and when we get to the big problem, um, you're either going to have a short or a long cash position. Most of you on the midterm were able to determine whether you were long or short cash. If you missed that part of the question, Monticia was very generous. She still gave you some pretty decent points to some of you that got going the wrong way, but uh, you don't want to get going the wrong way in the final. Okay? Uh, so if, you, if you're still unclear as to whether your cash position is long or short, based on the story I tell you, you need to work on that. So uh, we know that we have a cash position. It's either long or short, right? And then you know what to do in the futures market, right? I think the question on the, the midterm was uh, long futures, wasn't it? I think it was short cash, long futures, right? So if you got going the wrong way there, please work on that because then you're going to get really messed up when you get into options. 
So uh, you have to determine if you're long or short. So you were short, so you bought futures. Most of you did that just fine, which is great. Okay? And um, so then we start talking about hedging with options over on the right-hand side. This much you've figured out so far. The two left-hand columns, that much you know. Uh, so we get over to here. And as I said a few minutes ago, um, let's not worry too much about these, okay? At least for the final. You don't have to worry about those too much. Um, so we're going to set up the problem, and you're going to decide are you short cash or long cash. So if you're short cash, like you were in the midterm, then you want to buy a futures contract. Or the alternative is to buy a call, right? Because if you're short cash, that's really the Southwest problem, right? Southwest Airlines problem. They're concerned about a rising price in the oil market. That's why they buy futures. An option for them, well, I shouldn't use that word, should I? An alternative for them is to buy a call option. And that's what they do. They buy call options. If you're long cash, you notice know sell futures, that much you know, and then you buy puts. So there's just that one step that I'll be looking for in the final, and it looks easy on this table. Uh, and, you know, it's probably not best to memorize it, uh, but it's, it's here. Uh, if you're short cash, then I'm going to tell you a story. You're going to say, okay, we're short cash. Then I'm going to say, suppose you go in the futures market, here's the data. You carry the hedge through. You tell me what the outcome of the hedge was. Okay, you've already done that on the midterm, so we'll, we'll ask you to do that again with a different problem. And then we're going to say, now as an alternative, suppose you choose the options market. And I won't tell you whether you're to buy a call or put. You have to decide which one you're going to buy. I'll give you the prices. And you say, okay, well, if I'm short cash, I have to buy a call. And the reasoning is you're worried about a rise in the price. How do you profit from a rise in the price in the options market when you buy a call? If you're long cash, you know the sell futures because you're worried about a price fall. How do you profit from a price fall in the options market when you buy a put? So this will be the last part of the question is, do you buy a put or call? You decide which one. Uh, I'll probably tell you what strike price to use. I think I will. I'll tell you which strike price to use. And then you'll complete the hedge with the option. And then you'll draw a graph, the whole thing. Okay? That's the big question. So, I mean, half of it uh, should be no problem to you. And now it's just a matter of carrying it through. And don't get too worked up or confused. This part you know. So sort through that first. And then. It's a matter of either buying a put or call and, and working the rest of the problem. Okay, so let's go through some examples. And I have sort of a generic example, then I have an empirical example, and then on Friday I'll, I'll pull another one out of the hat, okay? Um, so let's start with being long cash. And you know the story there, your, your long cash. Um, so can you give me an example of a hedger that might be long cash? Anybody? Pardon? Farmers? Yes. Farmers, so you're either a soybean producer, or you're a corn producer, or you're a cotton producer. So you're a big cotton producer. Um, and the harvest is coming in. Well, you're long cash. You, you own a lot of cotton, right? And uh, the cotton price is not too bad right now. All this cotton's coming in. You're exposed to a fall in the price. So you're long cash, and we draw your cash position with this 45-degree line, where this is today's price. And um, I'm going to just set the basis at zero, just to keep things somewhat manageable here, OK, for the, for the purposes of the graph. And I'm doing something a little different here, uh, which I don't think you've seen before. And uh, if you're long cash, then as the price rises, OK, uh, as the price goes, in this direction, uh, then you're moving up this 45 degree line, so your effective sales price is higher. If the price falls, your effective sales price is lower. So that horizontal axis is labeled a little bit differently than what you've seen. Okay? 
because we're, we're working towards a price floor, or price ceiling here. Right? So um, the example of the cotton farmer, you suppose that farmer wants to establish a floor or a ceiling? Floor. Good. I didn't hear any ceilings. That's good. He wants to establish a price floor because they're worried about the price of cotton falling so they can establish a price floor at 60 cents a pound or whatever. And so we're looking at effective sales price. That's the question he's going to focus on. You use the futures contract. What was the effective sales price? What did they receive per pound of cotton? You use the options market. What was their effective sales price? That'll be the, the last part of each of these questions. Okay. And um, so if you're long cash, uh, you're worried about a price floor, uh, sorry, a price fall. You're worried about a price fall, uh, so you're trying to establish that floor. So you buy a put, right? We said Southwest buys calls. Maybe you can remember it that way. Southwest buys calls because they don't have the fuel yet. They're worried about having to buy the fuel at some future date and pay a higher price, so they buy calls. Because then if the price does go up, they'll make money on the call. The cotton farmer is going to buy puts because the cotton farmer is worried about a fall in the price of cotton. And you know that the payoff chart on your put, okay, you know what it looks like by now. You, you, some of the, some of these were drawn very nicely on the, on the midterm. Uh, that's what the put looks like, uh, and it gives you some protection if the price falls. But clearly, you have to pay this premium, right? So that's your payoff chart for the put. So now we have two assets. We have a long cash and a long put, so we have a hedged position, right? And we combine them. That's all we do. And remember, a week or 10 days ago, we were adding some of these payoff charts uh, together. And I said it would come in handy in chapter 9. And this is really what I was talking about. We went through this already when we talked about put call parity. Uh, and what does that orange line remind you of? What does it look like? What's long call? Thank you. So, what have you created? A synthetic call. You created a synthetic call by buying a put. Which is great because with a synthetic call, you've got yourself the floor price that you were after, right? And if the price rises, goes through the roof, the price of cotton rises because China has a problem with its cotton crop, well, then, you know, you just ride this baby up, right? Your payoff chart goes up. So that you get over on the right-hand side, that's where you have your cake and eat it too when the price of cotton goes up. So unlike with a futures position where one asset neutralizes the other, that is true on the left-hand side. If prices fall, well, the, the long put, the 45-degree line is going up. The, the long cash, the 45-degree line is going down. So one neutralizes the other. And that gives you your, your floor price. But if the price rises, well, you subtract the premium from, uh, well, in this case, I'm sorry, you would add the premium to give you a break even price of $35. And in anything above that, you'd make a profit. So this, uh, this looks like the price of oil or something like that. So let's see what I've done here. Um, so we've got the long cash, the long put. I hope there are no questions on those, right? And then the orange line is simply the vertical sum of these two. We've done this before. You know that when you add the straight line to the kink line, that the sum is going to have a kink, right? It's going to be kinked at the same point. So um, if I ask you to, and I will, I mean, the, the, the last part of the big question will be a diagram like this, right? And so you know, well, OK, this, this is kinked right here. So that looks like a strike price, doesn't it? That looks a lot like a strike price. And uh, therefore, if we add the two together, it's also going to be kinked at the same spot. So let's focus on this spot for a minute. So here we have um, $30 as the current cash position. Okay, So let's suppose this is oil. I have to switch to oil because the numbers don't match the cotton market. $30 is the current uh, price of oil. Your long cash, you happen to have some oil. You're worried about a price fall, you buy a put, 
that has a strike of 27. So it's a little bit below the current price, a strike of 27. And the premium you pay is how much? Can you see it here in the graph? Five bucks. You pay five bucks premium. Thank you. So that's what you paid for the put, was a five buck premium. So uh, let's look at 27 because that's where this is kinked. If the price happens to fall from 30 to 27, then we move down the cash line, $3. And what about our put? Is it in the money at 27? What is it? At the money. OK, do we get any premium back? No, we don't. So if the price falls to 27 bucks, then how does our return our effective sales price compare with the current price of 30. It's lower because first of all the cash price fell, right? The cash price fell three bucks, so we lose three. We pay five bucks on the premium, so we're down here at eight bucks. So the the effective price is eight bucks lower than this axis which relates to the current cash price. So we've established our floor price of eight dollars under the current price of 30, so that sounds like about 22 bucks, right? And another way of calculating that floor price is to take the strike, which is 27, and subtract the premium, which is five. Note the basis is zero, okay? I'm not adjusting this for the basis. Um, so 27 minus 5 is also $22. So what we've done with this hedge is we've established a floor price of $22 that gives us the minimum price we'll sell our oil for, ignoring basis risk. If the price rises to 35, well, we sell it for 30, don't we? Because we have to subtract the premium. So if the price goes to 35, well, you sell your oil in the market for 35, but then you subtract the $5 premium. So that, that's why that cross is at the zero. Right? You're just getting your premium back. Then anything above 35, then your effective sales price is in the positive range above the 30 bucks. Right? If it goes to 45 bucks, well, we're on this 45 degree line here, so we go up here ten dollars and we'd see a ten dollar addition to the current price of 30 so our price would be 40. If it goes to 45 we end up with 40 because of the premium. Questions on this diagram? If you don't know it's in your interest to ask me. Because it'll be really nice to know this on the final. Yes. Yeah. The question is, if you look at all the strike, different strike prices, there's one that'll give you the lowest price floor. That's true. So Depending on. Yeah. Exactly. And and I'll get into that in a minute. I have an example of where. We choose one versus the other and then kind of work through it. But you're absolutely right. Uh, when you choose the strike, you're choosing your level of protection, you're choosing your floor price. Okay? And clearly in this example, uh, because you're long cash, you want a higher floor price, don't you? But uh, there's, there's a catch. It's gonna, the premium is going to be higher. Okay? So, um, and, and what that means is uh, it's going to shift this orange line further to the right the, the more you move that floor price up. And uh, so then if the price happens to rise, you know, it's going to have to increase by the amount of the premium before you, know, you get your 30 bucks. Uh, so you're establishing a higher floor price. It's more expensive insurance. But if the price happens to go in a favorable direction, of course you're better off having bought a cheap option, right? I mean, if you're going to throw an option in the fireplace, I mean, I'd rather burn one that I paid $2 a barrel for than one that I paid $8 a barrel for, right? 
I'd rather burn a, a $1 bill than a $20 bill. Uh, so that's the catch. Okay, do you follow me? Yeah. yeah. Pardon me? Well, I'll, I'll explain um, the trade-off, and uh, so you're aware of it. And you know, I've just explained it conceptually. The, basically, the trade-off is you buy higher protection, you pay more for your insurance. But if you don't need it, then you're better off having bought cheap insurance. It's the same as anything else, right? If you look at your car insurance or your house insurance, if you look at your car insurance, uh, well, there's you know there's different levels of deductible, right? So you can pay you can pay more or less for your car insurance. So if you buy the most expensive insurance, uh, that's good if you get in a car crash, right? But if you don't get in the car crash, you should have bought the cheap insurance. Same same deal. Okay. Question. Okay. Thanks. You're gonna ask me about the car crash, right? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And, you know, for some hedgers, hey, that's the way to go. It's like uh, other forms of insurance, right? Some people buy the most expensive insurance. I mean, I have friends in Davis a couple years ago, they bought flood insurance. I thought they were crazy. I thought, you've got way more money than I do if you're going to spend money on flood insurance. And it turns out it didn't flood in Davis. I, I don't know the last time it did flood in Davis. But anyway, um, different, different folks have different utility functions, right? And some people have, are maxed out on insurance, others aren't. Okay. Uh, personally, I have the highest deductible on all my insurance, so I, I tend to go the route of, I have insurance, but it's the minimum amount, right? What's that? Yeah, although today I almost hit a student on a bicycle, so. <laughs> I was driving down Russell Boulevard, the light turned green, I hope it wasn't one of you. Uh, because I yelled at them, and and I, s I started going, and all of a sudden this bike, you know, swerved around my car, scared the heck out of me. I would have missed class, and uh, then it would have, would have cost me, right? It was scary. Okay. Uh, short cash. So that's the other alternative, right? We're long cash now. We're short cash. So um, note what I've done on the horizontal axis. Okay, circle that. Because when you draw your diagram on the final, uh, we're going to ask you to label it. And if you're short cash, we want to see effective purchase price, not effective sales price, right? Effective purchase price, because you're short cash. Here are your Southwest Airlines. You're going to be buying the asset, right? So you're short cash. And so if the price uh, falls, right, it goes in this direction, then you're going to be looking at a lower effective purchase price. So note on the previous diagram, we had a higher effective sales price. So that labeling has changed. So it's not just a matter of switching this one. So we have a short cash position. We know that you combine that with a long call, because if you're short cash, uh, you're going to have to buy the cash in the future. You're worried about a price increase, right? And you know in the futures market, you buy futures contracts. In the options market, you buy call options. So we buy a call. That's our payoff chart for the call. And this is our premium, right? That wasn't you on the bike, was it? No. Okay. He had a, uh, you know what a toque is, a wool hat? He had a, he had a toque on, so I couldn't really see who it was. But. Um, I thought maybe it was one of the students who missed the midterm was trying to crash into my car or something. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've now got the short cash and long call. These are the two assets in our portfolio. And what does that yellow line remind you of? What does that look like to, as a payoff chart? Long put. Somebody said long call. What does it look like? Long put. It looks like a long put. So you've created a synthetic long put. Synthetic long put. Which, <coughs> excuse me, which makes sense because, again, think of Southwest Airlines. They're worried about a price rise in oil, right? They don't mind if it falls. I mean, it'd be great if it fell down to 15 bucks a barrel. 
So in a way, they've created a synthetic put because if the price does fall, then it goes into the range where you have a lower effective purchase price, right? In this range over here. So this is the range of having your cake and eat it too on the lower end, right? So we do the same thing. Um, we're adding the white line to the orange line. Uh, you know that the sum of those two is going to be kinked. It's going to be kinked at the same spot that, that this line is kinked. So let's start there to draw this, okay? Because you're going to have to draw these. And again, I suggest you practice before the final, okay? It's, it looks easy when you're watching me, but just take out the Wall Street Journal because that's what I'll do. I'll be using prices from next week. Take out the Wall Street Journal. Choose a couple of contracts and say, okay, I'm short cash or I'm long cash. I'm going to take this position in the futures market. I'm going to take this position in the options market. This is how it'll work out if the prices go this way or that way, and then draw the graph, okay? And so this graph will be kinked at this spot. We add these two together. Starts at 30, we go up here to 33, which is a strike, so that's, that's three bucks. Uh, plus our premium is five, so that brings us down to eight dollars. So that's our ceiling price. And it's the strike, which is 33, plus the premium, right? In the previous example, it was a strike minus the premium. Again, the basis is assumed to be zero here. So it's possible that Southwest will pay a higher price than the 30 bucks. If the price of oil goes up, they might pay a higher price than the 30 bucks, but at least they've got a ceiling. And the ceiling is, is 30 plus 8, is $38, okay? Which is the strike, which is 33 plus the premium, is $38. So that's their ceiling. It's now 30 bucks. They bought insurance that they won't pay any more than 38 bucks. Ignoring the basis risk. So that's the level of insurance they bought. And of course, if the price falls, let's suppose it's at 30 now, it goes down to 25. Well, it's cost them a $5 premium, so they're still paying 30 effectively, right? They pay 25 when they go to fuel up the airplane, and then they're out the $5 premium. So in fact, they paid 30 bucks. And if it continues to drop below that, then they move up the 45 degree line, right? If it goes down to $15, well, then we've moved up here another, another 10 bucks, right? So they, their effective purchase price would be $10 under the 30, so they'd pay $20 if it ended up at 15, because they pay 15 in the spot market, $5 premium. So they can have the cake and eat it too if prices fall. And they have the ceiling price if prices rise. Yes? Yeah, there should, there should be um, a limit on the put option. If, if I said that, it's a mistake. Maybe you can show me the page. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you Friday. <laughs>